Thank you to each and every one of you in attendance here today who is joining us virtually. And thank you, Professor Lee, for providing me with this opportunity to bring welcome and greetings this afternoon. There are two words and one major theme that I've sought to underscore over the past two months since assuming this role as president. The two words are tradition and innovation. These are two words that come to mind when I think of Princeton Theological Seminary, when I think of this community at its best. Traditions those customs, rituals, beliefs, and practices that shape and form us. Like the Latin relegad, which many trace the word religion, it is that which binds, it's that which connects us. Tradition comes with obligation to build upon and move beyond that which was bequeathed to us and to be faithful stewards in order that we bequeath something of value to subsequent generations that will come behind us. Tradition. In a world that's obsessed with the individual, in a culture that increasingly views institutions not as formative spaces, but merely as performative spaces. Performative spaces to enhance our individual brands. Princeton Theological Seminary continues to form and shape faithful servants making positive impacts throughout the globe. Intellectual, spiritual, professional, and ethical formation, that's what we do. It's who we are at our best as a learning community. Yet the lasting import of this tradition is always a result of innovation. When I use the term innovation here, I'm not talking about or referring to some vacuous business speak. Nor am I referring to identifying more efficient ways to turn a quote unquote financial profit at the expense of people. By innovation in this context, I am referring to the ways that we enhance tradition with expanded moral imaginations. The ways our traditions become more flexible and accessible as a result of more inclusive conceptions of whom God calls and how we live out that call in the world. Oh, we can sing, give me that old time religion because it's good enough for me. But the question we have to ask ourselves, is it good enough to speak to the moral challenges, ethical dilemmas and cultural pressures of a world that looks very different today than it did even 23 years ago at the turn of the millennium? So we must make sure that we are building on the wisdom of the ages in, a ways, in ways that address the unique challenges of the moment. We must make sure that we leverage the richness of tradition with an anticipatory eye toward trend lines of the future. Tradition and innovation. I heard it referred somewhere else as reformed and always reforming. <laughs> and this is why the major theme that I've sought to underscore is our institutional commitment, our institutional commitment to this lifelong learning. Continuing education has long been a staple and an institutional distinction of Princeton Theological Seminary. At our best, we are a convening space and a dynamic learning community for religious professionals at varying stages of their careers. From the entering seminarian 
to the newly installed youth minister, to the mid-career pastor, to those who have retired from another industry yet have become active lay leaders. We bring together longtime pastors and towering tenured scholars from across the country with those who are spiritually curious and committed in our own backyards. This is who we are. And our programmatic and our curricular innovations have only enhanced this rich tradition in recent years. We have the most dynamic and diverse faculty in this institution's history. We have impressive academic centers and institutes offering a growing number of certificate and non-degree learning opportunities like this one. We have expanded platforms and modalities to make sure that Princeton Seminary's offerings are inclusive, not only of those who travel to us, but those who tune in to us even from Victoria, British Columbia. These are just a few of the reasons that I'm so excited to welcome you to this campus today, however you're showing up. The very title of this conference, Prayer as Resistance 2.0, signifies and underscores the interrelated themes of tradition and innovation ancient contemplative practices that catalyze us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before our God and with one another in the contemporary moment. Last week, I'd like to share, I had a wonderful meeting with a few members of the faculty, a few members of the faculty who met with me regarding the vision of the Center for Contemplative Leadership. And with intellectual clarity and moral conviction, they extolled the virtues of this conference in particular, as well as the work of Professor Bo Karen Lee in general. The ways that moments like this provide resources, spiritual tools, and networks of support. The manner in which moments like this activate our campus by becoming a convening space and a learning community that's not simply a dispenser of knowledge, but a producer of knowledge through leveraging the research competency skills and, and, and intellectual acumen of an array of communities and practitioners that have assembled together in this space. And the ways in which Moments like this allow Princeton Seminary to project to the world the best of intersectional coalition building. Intersectional coalition building grounded in common practice. Contemplative practice grounds us as individuals in all of our uniqueness, yes. Yet contemplative practice then connects us to shared visions, ideals, causes, and hence justice movements that transcend any one of us. And by doing so, it leverages the beauty of this space and the many identities here that are assembled into a diverse, beautiful patchwork quilt of beloved community. Amen. We all know both communities of faith and higher education are facing challenges that have been decades in the making. These challenges and trends have been exacerbated in recent years as a global pandemic forced all of us to reconsider our lives together. But the last three years have also caused communities to re-engage the larger questions of life questions regarding ultimate value and concern. What does it mean to be both more human and more humane? From where does empathy spring and how might eudaimonia and human flourishing be engendered? These are the questions that learning communities and spaces like this specialize in addressing. 
These are the concerns and competencies that this learning community answers when we're at our best. And we're at our best when we're together like this. So I'm grateful to all of you that you have answered Professor Bo Karen Lee's call to help us identify how we might further activate and expand our moral and spiritual imaginations in this critical moment through contemplative practice. Truth, beauty, goodness, tradition, innovation. These are the gifts that you bring to this campus. And that's why I'm so honored to welcome you either for the first time or welcome you back to this learning community for life. Thank you for being here. So are we ready to begin to transition to listen to amazing siblings, leaders, scholars, servants of God why don't I welcome our panelists to come up and situate themselves. And as we do that, I will um, let you know what, we'll take a break around 3.15, at which point you'll have snacks and refreshments outside. I'll give you a few announcements before that happens. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to introduce the six panelists informally. I'm gonna share why I love them informally. And then my dear brother, Shan, will introduce the first three formally. Then we'll take a little uh, mental break. We'll still be here. We'll take a mental break. We'll have announcements about spiritual direction. And then he'll introduce the next three formally. Um, so as we get our panelists up, I will begin by introducing, ah, there's my brother Leonard. Okay, Leonard and I met probably four years ago in Minnesota through the contemplative, I don't know, new contemplative leaders exchange. They're trying to pass down wisdom from Thomas Keating, Richard Rohr, um, Lawrence Freeman and Tilden Edwards, four big movements international. And they're like, you know what? We're getting older, we need to pass this down. And so that's how Leonard and I met, but just so touched by the magnanimity of his spirit that complements the brilliance of his mind. So thank you so much for being here, Leonard. Yeah, thank you, dear sister. And Leonard's also part of the advisory board. Lots of wisdom for us. And Kaz, I first met at a Justice Network conference when I was visiting Kensington, Pennsylvania. Kaz is now the director of the Simple Way Movement, which was founded 25 years ago by our dear brother Shane Claiborne and his friends. But Kaz is the director now. And I was mesmerized when I learned from her how she integrates contemplative practice with works of service and love in Kensington. And I was like, tell me more, tell me more. Only later did we get connected through the Shalem Institute for Spiritual Formation. And now she's a, a mentor of mentors in our peer mentor circle. So Kaz, thank you for being here. Thank you, Kaz. My dear brother Casey, the Han Chair of Theology, little known fact, we went to college together. <laughs> she was ahead. <laughs> I'm graying. <laughs> I don't know if that's his real hair or not. <laughs> Take off my wig. <laughs> I hardly ever talked to Casey in college, except I knew he was a really nice person. But boy, getting to know him as a colleague, a ball of fun, so self, so self-deprecating. One of the smartest minds you'll meet, but so humble, self-deprecating, and so ironic, a peacemaker. God has brought us a peacemaker in Casey Choi. Thank you, Casey. Yeah. <laughs> Joanne Rodriguez, her reputation precedes her. I've known her for years, but the director of the Hispanic Theological Institute. I have people coming to me telling me I met with Joanne and something she said changed my life. <laughs> I'm like, what was that? Oh, I need that wisdom too. 
such rootedness in life experience, but life savvy and wisdom, but humility, such depth of, of insight and, and intellectual rigor with a heart of love Amen. and real leadership. And so we're really honored to have you with us, Jillian. Thank you. Carrie Day! <laughs> you get a car, you get a car. <laughs> My voice was like, sounded like. <laughs> All right. Oprah Winfrey's voice, you know, when it goes up. Okay. Carrie Day! <laughs> we first met at the Wabash workshop for young professors, and I was like, okay, this is a special, special colleague. Only later did we become colleagues here, and I am privileged to be your sister and your friend and Dr. K's, Dr. Carrie Day's prayer partner. Amen. We love to pray together. Thank you, Dr. Day. She, um, Shan will do the formal intros, okay? These are the personal notes of family appreciation. And Shane Claiborne, I've heard him speak publicly numerous times, online, in person. I am so grateful. I met him first through his books, Irresistible Revolution. And being the giant that he is, he is still so happy to be with us, to share from his life and his heart how contemplative practice fuels all of his work. I'm always kind of like awed after I learn from this dear brother, but he has such a sweet and simple spirit. Amen. And so I thank you for your work in the world and so blessed that you're here, Sheen. Thank you. So now I will introduce to you my dear soul brother, Shan, who is the chair of our advisory board. He is a professor of leadership and forgiveness studies, right. a major award-winning poet, but I ain't going to name the awards because we're not about that here. <laughs> he is a brother of the spirit. He also is a counselor. I don't know how he has time to do all of that, but he has a lot of energy. Dear, fun friend and brother. So Shan's going to help us moderate this whole panel. Thank you. Okay. What a blessing to be in your presence, but also what a blessing to be in the presence of, and Bo doesn't probably like these things, but I am going to introduce her too, because she always introduces everybody else, right? And how Bo brings us together, right? You can just feel the nature of a person that has both wilderness and the force of love inside her, bringing us all to that creation. So Bo Karen Lee, is an associate professor of spiritual theology and Christian formation right here at Princeton Theological Seminary. BA in religious studies from Yale University, MDiv from Trinity International University, theology masters and PhD from Princeton Seminary. Her book, Sacrifice and Delight in the Mystical Theologies of Anna Maria Van Sherman and Madame Jean Guyon argues that surrender of self to God can lead to the deepest joy in God. And I've read that book and it's gorgeous. So please do pick it up. She has recently completed a volume, The Soul of Higher Education, which explores contemplative pedagogies and research strategies. A recipient of the John Templeton Award for Theological Promise, she gave a series of international lectures that included the topic, The Face of the Other, an Ethic of Delight. She enjoys teaching classes on prayer for the spirituality and mission program at Princeton, in addition, taking students on retreats and hosting meditative walks along nature trails. But what I will want to you know, really introduce her as is the writer of Proverbs uh, said some words that I think she embodies. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. Bo Karen Lee. Let's all get there. And on to our panelists, my brother Leonard McMahon. So good to see you again. Leonard McMahon is an assistant professor of pastoral, pastoral care, spirituality, and political theology at Pacific School of Religion holds a doctorate from the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley with work in spirituality, theology, and politics, MA in Religious Studies from UC Santa Barbara, MDiv from Harvard Divinity School. His interest is in political theology and improving civic engagement. Through his consultancy, Common Ground Dialogue, he works to bring diverse citizens into deeper conversation for the sake of our democracy. Leonard. Amen. <laughs> Kaz Pearson, blessed to receive spiritual direction from her some time ago last year. Kaz lives and works in Philadelphia as the director of The Simple Way, an organization supporting neighbors as they build a neighborhood they can be proud of. 
She trained as a spiritual director at Cairo School for Spiritual Direction and has offered individual spiritual direction since 2011. She learned the practice of group spiritual direction with Shalem Institute, facilitates group spiritual direction, and works at the intersection of faith and justice, integrating contemplation and action. Cass. Amen. And KC Choi. KC previously served as chair of the Department of Religion at Seton Hall University. His teaching and research areas encompass Protestant and Catholic ecumenical moral theology, theological aesthetics, peace studies, race and identity, and Asian American theology. Choi is the author of Disciplined by Race, Theological Ethics and the Problem of Asian American Identity, the first sustained account of the racialized contours of Asian American life by a theologian. He also was recently appointed co-editor of the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics. Casey. Amen. turn this this way okay can everyone hear me yes. oh okay great that's good uh well thank you so much i also like to take a, a moment to just thank um bo karen lee she's a dear sister to all of us uh we call each other brother and sister um so often and uh it's so good to see someone who is so at home in her skin live as an example for everyone else uh you know when you watch a musician perform on stage and they're, in their, they're doing their thing. It's kind of like that with Bo all the time. <laughs> so he's really inspiring. Uh, and uh, so as a, pol as a political theologian, I'm gonna say, I wish our political system was better built to entice people like Bo to get into it, but we'll get into that in a moment. Oh Lord. So let me start with a story. In 1962, a British political philosopher named Richard Wolheim wrote an essay, a small essay in an edited volume, in which he suggested an interesting paradox, okay, all right, an interesting, an interesting paradox in democracy itself. So we're talking about democracy, we're not talking about any other political system. In democracy, he noted a contradiction. And what he noted is that if a democratic citizen, a committed citizen decided between two choices, A and B, and chose A, and then was outvoted by the majority, B was the selected choice, that that person also somehow implicitly, equally, covalently voted for B. So in a democracy, this is sort of an inherent moral contradiction. How can this be? Both and. Does this make sense? Okay. So this is, again, a theoretical it's called Wolheim's Paradox, and it's really never been solved. There have been some uh, attempts at solution, but it really hasn't worked. Something like, well, he didn't really choose A, or she didn't really mean, it was tactically he chose you know, A, and in case B got chosen, something like that. These solutions really are not satisfactory. Morally, what Wolheim is pointing out is the both and nature. Charles Taylor picks this up in 1992 when he talks about uh, multiculturalism, he might have read this well-known essay, and at the end of which he tries to figure out between freedom and equality and liberal political theory, this is always a, a tension between freedom and equality, how can you have both and? How, what kind of person can live in society and exist with others in that tension and both and, freedom and equality? So these two moral problems frame democracy and democratic studies and political theory in general. What does that have to do with contemplation and why am I here? And what do I have to offer this, this weekend? The both and the ampersand is the same goal that we perceive, and it was mentioned by the president, and he left, uh, that we're both deeply individual and yet connected. How do you do both? How can it be both my full self and fully connected to another human being? much less more than, more than one human being. So that ampersand quality, that both and quality, is the sort of sensitive, sweet spot that we all are kind of chasing with our contemplative work. And so what I want to offer this weekend is something I call the truth method. The truth method is coming from the work we do with the Common Ground Dialogue. It is a method, it's a dialogical method of contemplation 
where you bring a person down to a point away from their perceived self, away from their self-image, away from the definite self, into a place of vulnerability, openness, connection, where that possibility exists. It's that sweet spot, right? They're still themselves, and yet they also can be fully connected. How does this happen? In the classical method, if you might know this, Greco-Roman method, the friendship, the dialogue between friends, gets translated in Christian spirituality to the dialogue between yourself and God. Our whole tradition is based on dialogue and friendship. Amen. And so what we do is we go back to that original practice, work with people gently, softly, slowly, bringing a person down to a place of vulnerability. And what inevitably happens is that kind of peace and quiet and vulnerability arises once a person has practiced this method for a while. And you do it in dialogue as opposed to most contemplative methods where you do it more by yourself. Bring a person down through their place of truth to a place where they are now open. So I hope to see you this Saturday. Thanks for having me here. I feel humbled to be at this table and to be at this gathering. Um, 18 years ago, I came to the United States from New Zealand to do a one-year volunteer service program because what I believed and why I believed it worked in the world, and I was going to tell everyone about that. And about six weeks into that program, I realized that what I believed and why I believed it only worked in my particular context and that um, I uh, that all began to fall apart. And so um, I've spent the next almost 20 years of my life trying to understand that. I, um, after the first year of doing the program, I began leading that program and um, did so for the next 15 years. And through that process of walking with 18 to 30 year olds coming into the city to live and work for a year, what I began to notice was that uh, they came because they wanted to love people, they wanted to serve, and they wanted to do justice. And in the midst of that, they began to, um, their faith began to falter. They began to not be able to find God, the ground that they thought that they had, they'd lost. And so um, that was my own experience as well. And so I found um, a grounding in Spirit, uh, with my spiritual director and contemplative practices. So I began to try to understand what is it that this kind of practice offers us in the midst of um, what we believe and then what we are trying to live out because sometimes we lose it in the middle there. Um, and so, you know, while I believe that um, prayer you know, offers us a connection to God and our worship, um, you know, joins with the community of believers to woo God's ear and our service helps us see one another, that those are not the goal in and of themselves, that, um, that those sharpen our intention to wake up to God. And um, in the work that uh, I do now in um, – Kensington, it's pretty practical work. I'm, I'm really just um, trying to help people get food through our food pantry and feel connected in our neighborhood. And um, that what I um, try to do in that work is to wake up to God and seeing my neighbor and loving the person right in front of me in that moment. And, and I believe that I'm lucky enough to meet God in those places um, and that my practices um, help me do that. So I'm glad to be here. Um, so I have something written. Can I read my, because I may end up t talking about baseball or something of that sort. <laughs> um, and I realize now that um, I'm gonna probably overshare and Zhao Li is gonna tell me that I'm over time but I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to ignore her. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> no, I'm, I would never ignore you, Sal. Okay. So, um, uh, Bo asked me to, um, well, asked all of us, but um, 
to talk about um, why contemplative prayer matters to us um, in the work of justice. So um, I, I'm, I don't think I have anything to say that's really all that innovative. Um, um, I think I'm just repeating basically what Bo has shared with us throughout today, but I've learned from the best. So uh, this is what I've learned from Bo. Um, on, so I'm gonna start with a story. On an early fa um, February Saturday afternoon, while I was picking up lunch at my local deli, the woman behind the checkout counter all of a sudden broke out in song, and I'm not gonna sing this. Um, <laughs> she, she broke out in song and she started singing, I've got a fire inside of me. And after singing that line a few times, she stopped and looked at me and said, I know we have it, I know that all of us have it good, even if most of us don't know it. So I'll be honest, the experience was more than I was looking for. I was just, I was just wanting to pay for a, a chicken, I think it was a chicken sa Caesar salad wrap and a roast beef sub for my two kids before their hanger became dangerous. But her singing stuck with me and was in a gift in a way. So I don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say that we live in a world of hurt. War in Ukraine, human rights abuses in China, the endless police beatings and killings, especially in black and brown communities, the ever expansive insatiable carceral state in the US, the absurd but very real sustained COVID scapegoating of and consequent violence towards Asians and Asian Americans, sexual abuse and trauma in both within and outside the church, the steady warming of our one and only planet and the persistent denialism of the devastating consequences of our Anthropocene moment. And then there is, of course, the steady growing drumbeat of vitriol against LGBTQ, LGBTQ communities. For example, I, you know, I said I was going to talk about politics, but I, I, I have to at least mention this. At last weekend CPAC meeting in Florida, one of the speakers called out for the eradication of trans persons. Eradication. So I can go on. I haven't even talked about inflation. <laughs> but need I say more? We indeed live in a world of hurt, and at times I often feel paralyzed thinking about so paralyzed thinking about soaking in the bewildering array of traumas afflicting us. God, what is going on? I often wonder, and sometimes bring me, I, I brim with anger, oftentimes just feeling dejected. Theological education, I think, is pretty good at making students attentive to their wounds, suffering violence and traumas that are endemic in so many of our communities. By the same token, I think theological education does a relatively poor job of helping us to be attentive to, to what makes the world a joyful reality. This is precisely why I'm so thankful to have encountered the checkout woman at my local deli, for she knew that we will not get very far unless we know, as she put it, that we have it good despite all the bad that is out there. In other words, what she reminded me of was that unless we are attentive to the goodness of creation and experience the joy of that goodness, then our hyper vigilance of and attentive to attentiveness to the sins of creation will ultimately lead to hopelessness, burnout, and perhaps worse, pessimism and despair. But the real problem I propose is that being attentive to the sins of creation is a lot easier than being attentive to the goodness of creation. Being attentive to the sins of creation is a lot easier thanks in part to social media, but sometimes that's a little too easy, and to what our major news media outlets prefer to cover, sin sells, sin is alluring. I'm always amazed at the number of people out there who just you know, love true crime programming. Therefore, if we want to be attentive to the goodness of creation and to find joy in that goodness, it will not happen automatically. It's something we need to learn how to do. It requires practice, a daily discipline of paying attention to that which makes the world good and worthy of joy. The British moral philosopher Iris Murdoch, though not an ally to religion per se, I have one minute and I'm going to totally blow it, once wrote <laughs> that the practice of prayer and more generally a contemplative, a contemplative disposition can aid in the grasping of the good. Contemplative prayer can do this because it is fundamentally a discipline that pushes us to displace the selfishness of our own consciousness, which, when, which then clears our vision to see dimensions of the world that we were too preoccupied to see in the first place. Mm. Murdoch thinks that spending time with great art can help us to develop this kind of contemplative vision. The great medieval mystic Julian of Norwich wrote about how paying attention to a tiny hazelnut in her palm led her to a vision of the goodness of existence, that the world exists because God desires it to exist. Amen. I will be honest with you, and I know some people are not gonna be happy with me. I'm not sure if art or nature can induce in us the kind of contemplative vision that uh, Murdoch or Julian of Norwich suggest it can. Uh, 
I'm more inclined to say that contemplative prayer can induce the kind of joyful vision we need to sustain our work for justice only when such contemplative prayer takes place in community. That is when contemplative prayer becomes a communal or a collective discipline. For it is in praying together that we become profoundly aware of the fact that a genuine and durable joy is in one another, in being with one another, just as God delights in being in relationship with us. So note that in this way, I do not think joy and happiness are the same. Joy is a relational affection. In other words, it is a state of mind and being that arises out of the recognition that we exist for one another. Happiness, in contrast, is all about me and what I want. It's about me and not the we. So when we pray together in this communal closeness, we are forming the habits of belonging, of being with and for another by learning how to listen to and bear one another's burdens. It is, in other words, praying together is one of the more profound and vulnerable ways through which we can, which we can, all of us can, as Pope Francis might say, encounter persons other than oneself and be held accountable to them and thus begin to experience the joy of friendship. I'm just smiling as Yao Li right now. Communal prayer, praying together forms our vision. It enables us to experience the joy of being with another. Friendship then is what makes justice work more than a duty or an obligation. When something is merely a duty, then it e too easily slides into being a chore. And when something becomes too much of a chore, then it too easily becomes a burden. But when we find joy in friendship, then the work of justice, no matter how difficult and how insurmountable that work may seem, becomes part and parcel of living fully. I think this is what the late Muharista theologian Ada Maria Sassi Diaz was getting at when she proposed that justice must be about struggle, la lucha, and not simply about survival. To simply survive gives too much power to suffering. To struggle for justice, however, is to be profoundly aware of that suffering. That suffering is not the last word. And for Isasi Diaz, it is in communal collective forms of celebrations such as fiestas that we learn in a deeply concrete embodied way not to allow only the suffering in our lives to determine how we perceive life. Last couple of lines, I promise. I'm all for fiestas. I like to think that communal prayer is just a different kind of fiesta an event that sustains our work for justice as an expression of joy. As the Delhi checkout woman I encountered earlier this semester taught me, unless we have joy burning brightly inside of us, our hopes won't get very far in this world. Thank you very much. So this is the little conceptual pause I promised you all before we go to the second half of the panel. And I didn't even know how perfectly uh, Dr. Choi's comments would feed this little interlude that I want to offer you before Shan then um, introduces the next three. And by the way, Ken and Amanda, I was off by 30 minutes. I forgot the panel starts at 2.30, so we're right on time, Ken and Amanda. So by the way, Casey, your, your beautiful manuscript, Leonard and I are working on a book right now on prayer as resistance, contemplative practices for racial justice. I would want your piece potentially to become a part of our volume, okay? So let's, let's talk about this. So Casey talked about friendship and joy as an essential part of our contemplative life together towards works of justice together. And the little interlude I'm about to share with you is an announcement that listening circles are being offered to you throughout the course of this conference. And we have slots lovingly set apart for you. I'll tell you, my, my student assistant, Wesley and Eli, they wanted to make sure that there were empty slots by the time we get to this conference so that you can discern in real time whether or not you want to experience spiritual direction. And they have come up with this elaborate, fancy system to, number one, honor your confidentiality, and number two, get you in touch with your spiritual director. So you can take advantage of that. Ken and Amanda are in the back. Can you stand? And they are going to help you with in-person signups. If you want to ask them, oh, what are the remaining slots? They know where all the slots are, all the empty spots. You can sign up for one-on-one -on -one or group spiritual direction. Group spiritual direction is where the friendship goes really deep among the peers. And then Eli, Henry, there's a Google dot being, ah, oh, there's Eli over there. Eli Henry is helping with those who are virtual. All our virtual guests, you have 
spiritual directors available for you online as well. And Eli has put together a very fancy internal spreadsheet and external spreadsheet to make sure you know what all the offerings are. And Eli will update that, putting it into the chat right now. We have such an amazing AirMeet team. Thank you, Eli. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kate. Um, so take advantage of this. If you go to the website um, that my sweet sweetheart will advance to us, if you go to our conference website, those who are online, those here in person, just click on that QR code, you'll see the bios of all the spiritual directors who are so beautifully available to serve you. To think about what living in community and friendship and joy might look like. And the reason we also interrupt or interlude here is because Leonard and Kaz are leaders in the Shalem Institute for Spiritual Formation Group Spiritual Direction Workshop. They teach this through Shalem, with whom we partner. The next workshop is September 22nd, 24. I'm giving away scholarships. We are giving away scholarships. We get one in Vancouver, British Columbia. So this is how Contemplative community grows through these listening circles. I'm also recruiting Casey to get trained with us. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. So that we can all imbibe this contemplative listening in friendship circles that can last you a lifetime, a lifetime of growing in friendship together, making the joy light and bright, and making the joy, making the work light and bright and joyful. So that's my little interlude. Now we're going to introduce the next three speakers and we will take a break either, depending on the time, we're gonna take a break at 3.15, probably at, right as soon as Shane is done, we'll take a little break. So we're actually right on schedule, everyone, beautiful. So ready to resume our conceptual conversations? All right, okay. thank you, Shane. Wonderful. Joanne Rodriguez is executive director of the Hispanic Theological Initiative at Princeton Theological Seminary. The HTI Consortium holds a membership of 24 PhD granting institutions whose purpose is the academic and professional development of Hispanic intellectual leaders as faculty in the academy, and thus as role models to inspire Hispanic students to aspire and achieve success to the full extent of their abilities. She is leader, speaker, social justice agent, and ordained minister since two, 2011 in the Presbyterian Church USA. Joanne Rodriguez. Amen. Carrie Day is an associate professor of constructive theology and African American religion at Princeton Theological Seminary. Among many books, she has authored Religious Resistance to Neoliberalism, Womanist, and Black Feminist Perspectives and was recognized by NBC News as one of six black women at the center of gravity in theological education in America. She has also been a political commentator and White House interlocutor on economic policy, religious freedom, and peace-building efforts around the world. Carrie Day. Shane Claiborne heads Red Letter Christians, a movement committed to living as if Jesus meant the things he said. Shane is a champion for grace, which has led him to jail advocating for the homeless and to places like Iraq and Afghanistan to stand against war. He worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta and founded The Simple Way in Philadelphia. His books include Jesus for President and Red Letter Revolution. His work has appeared in Esquire, Spin, Christianity Today, Time, and The Wall Street Journal. Shane Claiborne. Um, I want to thank both Karen and Lee for this invitation. And um, also, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, so I'm working this out, just to share with you. I'm kind of working out my contemplative practices. And one of the things that um, I want to say today is that you are an answered, embodied prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Years ago, when I came to the seminary, I was not happy with the curriculum that was offered. Mm. Um, the spirituality piece of it was missing. It was lacking. And many students have complained about this. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this center is, is an answered prayer for many of us. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I want to say that we are all answered prayers. Mm -hmm. We are embodied answered prayers for justice. If we're talking about justice, then we answered prayers. Jesus was prayed for 
for many, many years. And so finally, Jesus appeared in the most unexpected way that anyone could have ever imagined. I'm one, I feel like I am working that out myself. I never expected to be at Princeton Theological Seminary. I never expected to be at the Hispanic Theological Initiative. And more so, I never expected to be there 23 years. I was told this was a grant um, a program, and within the three years, it would be gone. Here I am 23 years later. And the program, thank God, is doing amazing work to support theologians, faculty, leaders across this nation. This has not been easy. Justice work is not easy, as we mentioned. Right righteous relationships are not easy to have. So three terms that I have really, I'm really contemplating is deep love, deep listening, and deep learning. Mm -hmm. And when I think about those three terms, I think about love first. I fell in love with the program that I now have been fortunate enough and honored enough to lead. <clears throat> I had to fall in love to, to do justice work. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to do it. God loved us so much that he sent his son. God loved me so much. Some, we were speaking this afternoon and saying, sometimes we ask the question, why me, right? Why? Well, that, that's an answered prayer and God's love for each one of us. It doesn't make us any more special than anyone else. It doesn't make us more capable than anyone else, it, but it's God's love and God and that loving God gives us exactly what we need, when we need it, how we need it. One of the challenges about seminary is that we think it's all about us. All education in this country, it's, we think it's about us. If we get the A, we're the top student. We get all the benefits. We're the ones that are, uh, are talked about in our families, right? The student that doesn't do well, even parents fail to talk about their kids if they're not doing well in school. So. We have to change that, and this is a way to change that. By doing contemplative prayer, we sit with God and we start to surrender to God our own being. And we surrender the work that we do to God first and foremost. And by doing that, we also get responses from God. And God starts to show us how God does appear in our lives. And not just through theological studies, but through everything through everything that we encounter to every person which we encounter. And we learn to listen to people very attentively. We become very present when we are in relationship with someone. We see their body expression, their facial expressions, the way their hands move, what they say, how they say it. And in that we learn to be more compassionate and caring and generous. We learn also to listen much more carefully when we, and we learn that God, when we listen to different things in our lives, the answers are there. Things start to appear. Things start to fall into place. We learn to be patient. That's what I've learned throughout these years. I've also needed to be more gracious to myself. I have been at the brink of burnout if I'm honest with each and every one of you. And the pandemic really did a job on us, it did a job on me. And I have had to now wrestle with that and discern how next do I live into um, this contemplative way. And, there, and we do need to take time to be still. And it is very hard because we live in a fast paced world. I'm over time, so I'll leave it there, um, but I just wanted, that's what I'm trying to work out myself, and that's how I have found um, justice in the work that I do, and also care for me and care of the other. Amen. Good afternoon. It's been wonderful to listen to everyone, and thanks again, my dear sister and friend, Bo, uh, for this, uh, this conference and for this time to share. You know, I was gonna talk about 
Um, uh, the work that I'm doing surrounding Azusa, uh, the Azusa Street Revival of 1906, and how um, this community, uh, classical Pentecostal community, and of course we know Pentecostalism is often not associated with contemplation or contemplative practices, how, how their understanding of prayer as a material practice sort of uh, um, um, uh, speaks to some of the questions around more holistic understandings of contemplation and so forth, and maybe in the Q&A we can get to some of that, but I feel led to go in a different direction. Um, this has to do with, um, and, and I really feel um, encouraged by the vulnerability that's been expressed on this panel thus far about their own uh, journey. And so in, in terms of part, part of my journey, I mean, you have within the broader world of activism, um, the work doing the work of justice and justice you know so far people are right it is about the struggle uh for for human flourishing for the flourishing of creation but it seems to me one of the central uh one of the central uh existential crises of the modern scholar in the academy and this would hold i think within theological education um is the struggle for intellectual mastery so I, I, I want to say a word about this because I think that part of the conversation, particularly about people that are participating in intellectual, I see a lot of students in here and PhD students, in intellectual production. Um, and I see, into, I see what I do in intellectual production as an extension of the justice work, right? Because justice work is epistemic and it is material, right? It is cultural and it is economic. It's all of that together, how we are transforming our worldviews and minds and how that bears down on the material realities that we live in. Um, but it seems to me that within the academy, there is this struggle for intellectual mastery so that knowledge becomes an end in of itself, right? It becomes an object, almost a commodity. Um, and it is, it is something to master, it is something to perform. Um, so that the question on what are the purposes and ends of knowledge as such, um, are unable to be answered. And I should also say this, that me being trained in a department of religion, even more, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, problematic, uh, is the kind of trauma then that I think many scholars uh, undergo being in the academy, with this, particularly within particular disciplines, is when they attempt to render relevant or they attempt to show these basic interconnections that already exist, and when we're talking about knowledge, we're always talking about the context, the life worlds, the communal uh, the communal realities out of which all knowledge emerges, right? And so, so again, the struggle for intellectual mastery. Um, and in, in, in this struggle, we don't, we're not able to get a sense of the whole. It seems that, you know, as an individual, I'm siloed off to my work, my interests, my, my projects, um, and I'm unable to connect to the wider community, the wider whole, and how that relates. And so for me, my own journey, and I'm not there, but for me, my own journey um, that I have been trying to cultivate and, and through the contemplative practices that I've embraced, and I've tried, I'm trying to take along students that encounter me, students to bring them alongside me, is instead of thinking about uh, uh, participating in the struggle for intellectual mastery that that the academy just lauds as the one at the holy grail, the only way, is to think about how we might participate in the struggle for intellectual surrender. And I think that, you know, in thinking about the life of the mind and thinking about what we do and why we do, um, it's about in some ways um, a surrender to first that which is greater than us, right? That, that is God um, and the purposes of knowledge that, that, that come to uh, help us to help illuminate how we might better be with and for creation and, and of course with others but also through intellectual surrender, um, it, en it, it enables us to cultivate the kind of joy, the kind of friendship, the kind of community that sustains our work, that, that, that allows us to see why we do our work and that indeed it is work in service to the world, okay? And so for me, then I'll end here, uh, this is why the contemplative practices have been so important for me, is because if you're talking about intellectual surrender, it involves releasing, abandoning, walking away from the impulse 
to perform mastery, control, all of these things that are connected to achievement and human, you know, and, and therefore worth in the academy and so forth. But instead, in being on the spiritual path with others, um, it allows us to lean deeply uh, into this practice of intellectual sur uh, surrender, which I think fundamentally is a spiritual practice. And in doing that, it connects us back to the purpose and ends of knowledge in the first place. And most importantly, it connects us to each other and ultimately to the justice work of which we're about. Great to be a part of the conversation. I'm just going to, they're beautiful. <laughs> uh, wow. So I, I uh, want to speak to the prayer as resistance a little bit. And I should say that I've gone through, you know, my own spiritual journey. I, I grew up Methodist and got Pentecostal, got rebaptized because the sprinkling didn't count, you know, and then I... Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I really got formed by Catholics as well, and Mother Teresa in particular. I think when I went to India, um, I learned a depth of prayer um, that was all about us being transformed by our prayers. And uh, one of the prayers that Mother Teresa prayed every morning uh, was, Dear Jesus, may I leave off your fragrance everywhere I go. May I see your face and everyone I meet, you know, and so these were the prayers that we prayed. And so those for me, we also had uh, communion every morning. I was asking some of you know, one of the nuns, like, why do we do communion every morning? It's a little redundant for a Methodist, you know, we do it like <laughs> once a month. And, uh, and <clears throat> she said, well, you've heard you've heard the saying, we are what we eat. And she's like, it's kind of kind of what we're going for, you know, and um so I sort of like, you know, I sat with that and I, I mean, that's shaped and formed me. I, I think my prayer has grown. And in fact, 10 years or so into the, our community at The Simple Way, we tried to create a prayer book that integrated protest and prayer, uh, resistance and contemplation and um, we call it common prayer, not the book of common prayer, let, lest we get sued, but this is, uh, you know, our version <laughs> And you know, I brought a few copies, but some of the prayers that we prayed every day in India are in there. There's 50 songs from different traditions. Uh, we got spirituals and freedom songs and hymns. We couldn't have any contemporary songs because they cost too much. It's like a, all these contemporary artists are like, Jesus gave me this song, but if you want to sing it, you need to pay me royalties. And I've always thought that odd, but... Even the songs we had had like thirty thousand dollars worth of copyrights. But anyway, you know, like we we created this prayer book because it weaves together the different traditions and it it keeps our prayer life anchored in the world that we live in. So throughout the year, we're remembering you know saints with a big S and little S, but we're also remembering history. You know, we're remembering when uh, Oscar Romero was killed in, in, in uh, El Salvador. We're remembering when we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We remember when Rosa Parks uh, refused to move on the bus. And so we're kind of anchoring our prayer in our history. So that's um, my kind of backdrop with prayer. But I thought, you know, I, I, I wanted to share a little bit about how we've come to think of protest as a form of um, liturgy. Um, and I can say that, you know, I began this this kind of journey like by mistake almost. We were um, challenging anti-homeless laws in Philadelphia, laws that made it illegal to sleep in public, illegal to, uh, it was illegal to share food. You literally could not buy a pizza, take it to Love Park and give it out. So we prayed about that and we thought we need to challenge these laws. And the most powerful protest that we had was communion. Um, we we decided to be subtle and uh, you know have a worship service and then we serve communion which was technically illegal, and um, all the police officers were like, I'm not gonna arrest them. No communion, like, I ain't messing with God, you know. And uh, so we um, you know we were arrested. We were arrested and uh, we went to court. We fought. We actually argued our case uh, of religious freedom, that it was a violation of our right to religious freedom to say that we couldn't eat in the park. But we also said it's also a violation of religious freedom to say you can't feed somebody because Jesus said when you did it, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. So uh, we, we won. Amen. 
And we've supported our friends on the border that make that same argument when they put uh, water in the desert for immigrants and refugees. We've seen like protest is a form of liturgy. Um, at Christmas, we went into the uh, the Senate chambers and we, we carried 3,000 stories of immigrant families, of dreamers, and we began to ra- read them. As a form of prayer and contemplation, we would pause after each one. And then um, we would lead prayers together. And, th- you know, it was ironic because they came with a megaphone and told us we had to leave. And, uh, and we sang Silent Night very gently and tenderly as we were arrested. Um, so you see a theme here. You know, but I think that there is a part of resistance that is all the more powerful when it's rooted in liturgy and prayer. I mean, our newest work, I think I showed this last year, was we're, we're turning guns into garden tools. You know, so I tell my evangelical friends, this is what a gun looks like when it gets born again. And um, <laughs> Uh, this is every, every part of that is uh, made from a gun. And um, but as we do it, it's a form of liturgy. You know, we say it's sacramental and we've seen moms and dads, children that have lost their parents beat on the gun. And we'll do this on uh, during Holy Week outside of the Episcopal Cathedral in Philly. We're actually going to do it on the day that Dr. King was killed. We're going to beat on a gun 55 times as the Episcopal bells ring 55 times, remembering the 55 years since Dr. King was killed. So I say all that to say, like, I think we need to think of protest as a form of, of liturgy and prayer. And uh, it's all the more powerful when it's anchored in our faith.